hard but then also be understanding if we because there's so much prep as you know that goes into a game then you you lose a game and let's say you had a play you're playing the, the play over well th maybe this is just me i'm playing the play over in my head i could have done that differently man i could well, like and, i should right <laughs> and and i think as an athlete like there are real consequences and and uh, to make it to the highest level you have to have a degree of um an ability to sort through that and, and yeah. continue to perform because otherwise you get weeded out the guys yeah. that you know burn out stress out they don't make it to this level yeah. high performance every vessel or human fine-tuned to perform the highest standards the summit of all your strengths and capabilities combined to maximize your potential but can you apply the principles from world-leading experts to optimize your performance, to enhance your gift and ensure it impacts as many lives as possible? To help you on your gifted path, your next set of remarkable masters are waiting. An award-winning speaker who takes the gifted from the sidelines and turns them into difference makers. A professional athlete whose curiosity and passion for performance and consciousness are taking him on a journey of discovery. And an industry-leading high-performance coach who works with Olympians and competitors at the highest levels, who will all help you answer the question, how do I reach my peak performance levels? Amazing. Okay, so Matt um, and friends, the way I love these things to roll out is that imagine the four of us are out for dinner and the kind of conversation we would have there is what I want to have here. So I, I don't want to me, interviews are boring. Um, typical podcasts are boring. Well, not boring, but they're like, uh, unless it's different, I can't do it myself. I like I need to, I, you know, you all know, and you, you know, see my events too. So like, I can't do things like everybody else. I have to be different. And the difference is the conversation. And what that means is that feel free to ask me questions, feel free to ask each other questions, feel free to comment on each other's comments and answers. And like, I love when it's more dialogue instead of one-on-one -on -one interview kind of thing. Like I will lead and I have a whole bunch of topics that I'm curious about um, and then we'll see where things go. But there's uh, like my dream come true is that it feels like we were literally out for dinner. Is that cool? Where, where are we having dinner, Gio? <laughs> where do you want to go? I, I, I like um, STK. Do you guys go there? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Yorkville one, right? That's the only one there? Well, I've been to the Yorkville. I've been to New York. Uh, there's oh, one God, in God, LA God. we've been to. Yeah, so we had a couple end of year parties at that one in Yorkville. It was a good time. <laughs> I'm right. taking notes. <laughs> okay, so I will begin the reason I've asked the four of us here today <laughs> and the three of you is because uh, there is a common through line of professional sport and I'll get into that in a second we'll do some quick intros uh, I don't like big intros but the the bigger picture for me is that I see a through line and an analogy and a crossover for what it takes to be a professional athlete to what it takes to be a professional anything, whether you are uh, in a career or an entrepreneur or a writer or a plumber or a dentist. There, there's a lot that has to happen. And I think there's so much that I can learn from the three of you with respect to how to show up as a professional no matter what and how, what to do when things aren't going right and what to do when things are going right and what it's like to be on a team. And there's so much um, opportunity for learning. And uh, I'll start with some, and, and what I love about the three of you is that there's, there's like patterns, there's a crossover between all three of you, even though uh, you're doing different things. So, uh, and, and maybe we'll do some intros too, because actually you may have all been at the exact same event. I have to figure this out. So, um, Connor, I met yeah. you uh, when we do our big Archangel Summit event. Uh, we have VIP tickets, and then we have a VIP dinner for people who have those tickets. And you came up to me and Stephanie um, at the dinner with a friend of yours. 
I didn't know who you were at all. And you just tapped on my shoulder saying, thank you so much. This has been such an awesome event. You know, can we take a picture? So we're taking a picture and I'm casually asking, you know, what do you do? Because everyone who's at this event is typically entrepreneurial. And you looked at your buddy a little funny and you're like, um, uh, we're in professional sports or some kind of answer like that. I'm like, Oh, cool. Are you like a, a coach or, or like, what do you, what's your business? And you're like, uh, I play for the Toronto Maple Leafs and he plays for the Washington Capitals. And I was like, Oh shit, I should really watch more sports. Um, and, and that's how our friendship, um, developed and, and you've been playing professional hockey for years. And, and, uh, I love having conversations with you about this topic. Um, Matt, uh, our story is that one day you replied to one of my emails and we send emails to, you know, thousands of people, but then I replied back to you. And then you said, holy shit, I have responded to so many people's emails like this. You're the first person who actually responded. Who are you? <laughs> and we had, I, again, I didn't know who you were at the time either. You were, you were someone who came to our event. I'm thinking it could be the same one. And then we, we chatted and got to know each other through email. And you're like, you know what? We should meet up for coffee. Uh, let's meet up on this day. It was a Friday. And the day before, I realized it was a PA day for our kids on that Friday. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the worst. I don't want to cancel. So I reached out to you. I'm like, is there any way you can come to my house instead of going out for coffee because I have the kids here? This is my address. And you're like, dude, <laughs> I live a two-minute walk from your house. <laughs> So that's how that Matt started. And then Orlando, I actually remember, um, I don't even know if you know how I found you, but it was Lisa Larder, who uh, has, is a friend that has come to many of our events. And she, and she sent me a video of you. And she's like, if you don't know Orlando, you need to know Orlando. And then that spawned and sparked into you speaking at the event where I met Connor at, on our stage at Archangel Summit. And, and, uh, for more context, you've also, you are, or have been a professional athlete. You played in the Canadian football league for the Toronto Argonauts as well as the Hamilton Ticats. So all, all of you have, Oh, and Matt, we didn't even say, okay. Uh, Matt, do you want to share your history with the Toronto Maple Leafs? Yeah. I mean, I've, wor I've worked, uh, yeah, I had a, a long career in sports. I did work for the Leafs, but before that I had a, I had a better job. I was Orlando's coach. Believe it or not, so we well, Orlando what? and I go back about twenty three years. Yeah. Oh my God! No way. Yeah. Long time. So yeah, I did work for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So. That is. See what I mean? <laughs> We're always going to find these wild. Thrills. After I stopped coaching Orlando, I had to I had to slum it with the Maple Leafs for a few years just to pay the rent. <laughs> All right. So, Orlando, what? Why did you stop football? So I, I uh, first of all, I'm so excited to be in this space with you guys, man. Connor, hailing from Shy Town, you know Matt. We go way back, as as you mentioned, uh, Coach Lisa doing the magical introduction with you, Gio. Um, you know, it's a gift to be in this space. First of all, uh, why I stopped playing football, I had uh, suffered a severe concussion uh, at the hands of two corrupt undercover police officers. Um, who happened to work for the police force that I was actually uh, their spokesperson. And I, you know, trained a number of their officers in racial sensitivity and I did work to bring police and community together. And um, yeah, when, so at, after the assault, the physical aspect of the assault, uh, when they realized that I was that guy and very active and that, you know, some of their colleagues would come to my games, um, you know, a huge cover-up began where I was taken to jail, and it was just this incredible, uh, some, you know, unbelievable, at points, journey uh, that um, that resulted in my football career being over. Uh, but that said, um, you know, the way we've transitioned to be doing things that are of significance in terms of what I consider to be life and death. Uh, working with people, bringing hope, perspective, and possibilities through the work that we do with companies and the work we do th through uh, young people and cultivating their leadership and giving them opportunities to serve. So. And I, I feel like 
the path you've been on and the, the insanity you've been through has shaped you and unleashed your gift in a new way where you are serving people in a, in a completely different way and yet you're still serving and maybe even impacting on a much bigger level than you could have ever before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that, you know, and, and, you know, to Matt's earlier point, we go way back and I remember like at the time of the assault, Matt was so heated. He was so upset. We were upset. We were challenged by it. It was hard for me to, you know, even go into details about it because I was trying to make sense of what was happening um, because not only was I assaulted, but uh, uh, they decided to try to cover up by planting drugs by my car and then charging me with assault and possession of a controlled substance. So I went from being an athlete that was celebrated in, in certain spaces to being one that was now um, not able to pass my physical to play and um, facing prison time. Uh, so journeying through all of that has really allowed us to connect with uh, folks who may feel like the situations that they're facing is insurmountable or unbelievable or pinch me, this can't be happening type of thing. Um, and we help to bring hope and, and, and perspective and tell folks that, you know, as challenging as that was, um, I think it was one of life's greatest gifts because it, it allows me to be fully present as a father, as a husband, as someone who serves in community, as a teammate, and uh, real, you know, really uh, do all that I can, recognizing that every single day that we have here is a gift, um, and also recognizing that there's such power in forgiveness and, and releasing energy that's connected to uh, incidences that don't allow us to see uh, what's possible. Matt, I didn't know that you two have known each other that long, nor did I know you were around during all of this. What, um, since you've been on this journey with Orlando even longer than I have, what transformation have you seen in him? Well, I could, I, I would say this. I mean, sure, certainly, Orlando has grown and and uh, and developed, and and people that are getting to know him now post that event are appreciating, uh, you know, all of his incredible qualities, but this is always the guy that he was. So it wasn't, it wasn't like this, uh, this event happened and he became this incredibly inspirational, motivational, positive, optimistic. It wasn't, it wasn't that at all. I mean, from the first time I met him, he just, he, he walks into a room and just, you know, it, it's a, it's a often, you know, to a phrase that's used too often, but he just, he lights up the room. He brings the energy. He's always been that person. And, you know, it was, it, I mean, technically I was his coach, but in this group that we had, we had a group of football players, uh, a couple of NFL guys, a bunch of CFL guys, some NCAA guys, you know, I, I was, I was technically the coach, but really, you know, or Orlando was sort of the leader from within. He was the leader from within the group that, you know, brought the best out of everybody, held everybody accountable, not, you know, made, made everybody accountable, but not in a negative way, you know, in a very positive way, uplifting way, but he was that, he was always that person. Uh, and I think, you know, it's funny, but, you know, and Connor can appreciate this too. Like when in the, in the world of sports, when you talk about when people, when players are asking you about another player, whether a guy gets traded to the team, a coach or a scout is considering a player, they'll say, they'll, they'll reach out to, to Connor and say, Hey, what's, uh, what's Geo like? And in, in the world of sports to be able to say, Oh, good guy, he's a good guy. That's, that's enough because they have scouts and people that can run the numbers and figure out if he scores the right number of points or he plays a certain way. But you want to know if he's a good guy or not a good guy. When people would ask me about Orlando forever, not just now, the answer wouldn't be a good guy. It's like, literally, he's probably the best guy that I know. He's probably the best guy. He's just this unbelievable. So when all those things happened, I mean, it's, it, it's, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And he's downplaying it. And, and he, he, he's helped me. You know, I, I, he's become my coach in life. And we joke about this, like, I get cut off in traffic and I can't let it go for like a week. You know, and like, I don't know how he's been able to transcend the things that's happened to him. I need his guidance all the time. But I, I know that, you know, if, if it would have happened, there's so many other, you know, guys in our group. And I love, I love all of my, I genuinely love all of my athletes. I, they're all different and they're all special. But, you know, had it been player X over here, if I had heard that news that this had happened, I might have said, that's terrible. But uh, yeah, you know, may, maybe I could see, I could see, or this guy. Uh, it's, yeah, it's too bad that it happened. But yeah, maybe I could see how that could. As soon as I heard it was Orlando, 
there was just not even there was just not even a question like this is this is wrong. This is just he didn't do these things. It's not this guy. It's impossible. It's impossible that it would be that person. So I, I think that you know I, I've seen uh, I've seen him become an even more prolific speaker than he already was. He already was fantastic, but I, I think in in some ways, and it's, it's terrible that it had to happen the way that it did. But I think he probably was destined for greatness beyond not. And, it, and I was a, a failed football player. I tried. I, my dream was to be Orlando. That was, but I couldn't. So I had to be a coach. That was the next best thing. But I think from the moment I met him, I realized this person was destined for greatness beyond what he's already doing, which is great. But I, I knew there was something bigger for him. It's 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 awful that it had to come about the way that it did, but. I see him now becoming that person that he, that he already was and always was capable of being. That is beautiful. So you are now, you're, Matt, your thing now is strength coach. Is that the right phrase? Yeah, it's my, it's my job title. I mean, I, I'm, I don't know. I think I'm, like, I'm like an anthropologist. I get, to, like, I, get, I get to go hang out every day with like the coolest people and watch them do cool stuff and hear about their cool stories and... Then, then when they're done, they go off and live their cool life, and I can watch them on TV and see what they're doing. That's so. I guess the job title, strength coach. I'm not sure what what you really call it, but I mean, I, I'm were, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm, you, you work. It's Orlando's. Go ahead, bud. Well, I feel like even as I think about Connor and Connor's journey, right? And and Connor, you've been around coaches, um, you know, athletes that have been transformative with respect to perspective, right? And the energy that you get, and you have the folks that could teach you the things. Um, that are uh, the X's and O's and the tactical things. And then you have folks that they teach you how to see things differently. Those coaches, you always remember. Those teammates, you always remember. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure Connor could speak to some of his experiences that way. I'm, I'm interested. Like, talk to me about what's happened, uh, you know, on the ice that way. Uh, but I will say that Matt has been that for a lot of, a lot of athletes that have helped people see a bigger picture. And not just because there's coaches that will say, all right, here's uh, 10 things that I need you to do. Go do them. Right? But he's not only telling you the, the things, he's telling you why you're doing what you're doing. Right? And that understanding as an athlete um, transcends sport because it gives purpose to the activity. It gives perspective to how this is going to impact what happens on the ice or on the field or or on the pitch. And, and that... Uh, yeah, that's 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 crucial. One of the reasons I wanted to connect Connor and Orlando, um, Connor, when I first met you, one of the things that really stood out that I loved is that you have the mindset of an an athlete that wants to be the very best version of themselves on the ice, and uh, you, you train so hard. And you're already thinking about the next thing, meaning what happens after hockey or after professional sport, because what I, and maybe Matt and Orlando can attest to this. What I think I see as a pattern is that most pro athletes feel like this is it. This is my whole life. This is my identity. And then the sport ends and there's like an identity crisis because their identity was so attached to the uniform that they don't even know what to do next. And then there may be even depression or, or, or worse. And, you know, I, I love talking about identity and the idea that it's not permanent and that we can shape who we are. And I think it's huge in your world. And I, I mean, I, I love about it. I, I appreciate you bringing that up, Gio. And I mean, Matt can attest to this. I train hard because that is just the standard in our sport it is so saturated with guys that train and play like dogs for two years for 10 years for 20 years and i think as orlando was uh you know lauded by matt i think for within my career i really just always wanted to be a player that when i had moved on to another locker room i wanted to be missed uh, I remember I was, you know, kind of in high school, uh, the Chicago Blackhawks were winning, you know, Stanley Cups. They were, you know, kind of the doormat of the league growing up. And then they were, you know, reaching this golden era. And I remember the way they would talk about a Duncan Keith, his preparation, his ability to play, you know, every single night. 
uh, and kind of what limited Tim. And, you know, he just said it was being sick or being hurt. Those are the two best ways to play poorly. And so that was really where it cemented, you know, how hard I wanted to work and how smart I wanted to work. That's one story that I leveraged to kind of form how I wanted to go about pro sport. And then the other side, I think the reason I was interested in life after hockey is, and, and Matt and Orlando can talk about this, like you officially retire once, you know, you move on from the game in, in, in totality once, but you have as an athlete, like, like a cat, like nine lives, you, you die almost a thousand times. Every last little injury, every bad play in practice, a coach comes up and talks to you. Pro sport is very much, what have you done for me lately? Me and Orlando were joking about it before the show started. And by lately, I mean like yesterday or within the last 10 minutes. Um, and that's just how competitive the sport is. And I had all these stories I'd, I'd heard about drug overdoses, athletes going broke, athletes, uh, the, the divorce rate. And from a, a place of fear, I wanted to arm against that. I'm like, I, I don't want that to be the end to my story. And so the, the fear and I think the appreciation for just how I think and view the world, I, I've always been a little bit on the, the busier minded side mm -hmm. of athletes and mm -hmm. just don't think was really the only advice I'd ever gotten. And, and that's a difficult place to be. It didn't really serve me. And so when I started entering into some of the self-development, uh, your world with Archangel, I started to find role models that weren't Nicholas Lidstrom and, and you know, big time NHL defensemen I had looked at. They were role models in the business world uh, mm -hmm. doing, you know, great things like Orlando does uh, with a sense of service. The way Matt, I mean, I was uh, a BioSteel, you know, camp and product consumer before they even had a label. Uh, I always had my ear to the ground on, on what the role models in my career we're doing and you know what you do with Archangel kind of lended another platform for me to investigate I I, I want to say something about Connor's um, level of awareness uh, as an athlete um, I don't I don't necessarily maybe in the circles that I've been in um, I don't think it's the norm to have that level of awareness in terms of what what's going to happen after because it's a scary thought for a lot of athletes, right? I don't, you have guys, you know, that from they were like this big, they were labeled as like, he's the next so-and-so. And he walks into a classroom or, she, you know, for, for the female athletes, she walks into a classroom and it's like, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. That's So you, you begin to embody and embrace that uh, persona, right? And then... You know, so to even be aware and be open to think about, well, what happens if or what happens when, because it's really not a, not a matter of if, it is when, um, it's it's big to do more than just think about it. Because if we were having a conversation about like, so what about when we're no longer playing? Guys would be like, well, listen, man, um, <laughs> it's just not a comfortable place. Right, so I, I applaud you, Connor, for um, doing well, what I, I mean, just I'm, thinking about it, man. I'm sweating just talking about it. Like, it, you know, it, it's something that, even though I've taken steps, it, it's a it's a big daunting day when you move on. You talk about social status. I mean, I was that guy. Hey, you call a restaurant. Hey, I'm Connor Carrick from the Toronto Maple Leafs. You guys open tonight for 15 people at 7 p.m. at STK Toronto. They're like, yeah, no problem. We'll make it happen. <laughs> right. You know, and so there's a certain level of clout. There's a you go to family parties, you're the guy in the NHL. Hey, you know, talk to my son Connor, sign this puck for this kid. And and you 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 embrace that community responsibility. Uh, there's a financial component. You're you're making a certain amount of money. You're young, you're you're still trying to figure it out. It's kind of this funny concept where all of a sudden you have a good year, even though you're the same guy, same player, you had a good year. We're just gonna pay you five X what we did last year. And then, oh, you were playing the same well, the same way, but you broke your leg and missed half the year. Here's you know twenty percent of your last salary, and I've you know experienced kind of it's kind of both those things, and it's volatile and it, it's extremely unknown. And we know, you know, the human consciousness has a desire for maintaining the patterns in our life, and it's a pretty big pattern interrupt that meets us all eventually. I have a funny question for Matt. I have a feeling I might make him laugh. I'm, I'm going to try. 
<laughs> so I uh, I scroll through Instagram sometimes, and I see these, I don't know what to call them, um, Instagram fitness influencers doing the most ridiculous fucking exercises I've ever seen. <laughs> yes, I got them told. That's the key. That's the key to longevity. <laughs> Upside um, down jumping jacks. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Jesus. And I, part of what I, I'm hoping you're going to share, which I, I think you will, um, that I believe is that with respect to fitness um, and strength training, it has to be boring, meaning you actually succeed with consistency doing the same basic stuff over and over again. And it's not sexy and it doesn't maybe blend well for, for social media. But when, when you have, like you have the best of the best athletes coming to your facility to get trained, are they doing those gymnastical throwing <laughs> 45 plates and catching it and <laughs> hanging it <upside> down? <laughs> like what happens in your space? And, and, what does it actually take? It, it's, it's interesting to me. I mean, th this whole world of social media is so, I mean, uh, I don't, Gio and I might have to compare, compare notes and birth dates here, but I, I, I might be the oldest guy on, on this call. But I mean, I, I didn't have a computer until after I had finished my undergraduate degree in university. Like forget about, forget about Instagram, forget about internet. There's, I, didn't, like, I had a Smith and Corona word processor where I, you ha I literally had to type the, the friggin' notes. But so I, I, it's all, it's all very strange to me, but I think, yeah, like uh, it, you know, and that's, that's been Gio, you and I have talked about that's, that's been my struggle is all, I might sit down and pour my heart into a post. That's uh, something that I think might be beneficial, you know, a book that I read that I think might be good for kids or something. And, you know, one of my clients who's got a half a million followers will, take a picture with his shirt off and say TGIF and he gets eight gazillion likes and you know, <laughs> seven people looked at my thing. So I, I, sometimes I, I you got to quit getting your clients. So Jack, yeah. that they get 8 million <laughs> likes every time they take their shirt off. That's what yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm the guy writing the program and I look like a bag of shit and they look fantastic. So I, I don't, I don't really know how that works, but, um, but yeah, I, it's, it, it, I think you have to have a blend of both. I think that, um, if you're going to be a professional athlete, and I, I, I've got some athletes as young as 14 years old, and I've got I've got executive clients, not athletes, but they were former athletes. I've got two clients that are 78, one that I've had as a client for 24 years. Uh, if, if you're going to do, if you're going to be a professional athlete, and you're going to do this for the next significant chunk of your life, whether that's five years, 10 years, 15 or 20, you do have to find some way to make it fun. And, and, I, and I'm not and I, I'm not talking about hanging on a chin up bar, riding a bike or, you know, whatever the, 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 the flavor of the week is. And, and it's, it's incredible to me. It's like a, it's the dumb thing, you one. know, it's like a, a race to see who can put the dumbest fucking thing on inner, like, I, I don't understand, but it's entertaining and people like that. And you know what? I, I, I have to realize now as I'm getting older, I have to, I have to evolve. I have to grow. I have to learn all of my young clients. They're, they're on, they're on these platforms and they come in and ask me and they say, Hey, what about this? Did you see this exercise? Hey, did you do this thing? And I know that, you know, maybe 25 years ago when I started, I could show a hockey player, hey, this is called a push-up. And they go, whoa, this guy's a genius. That's unbelievable. <laughs> What'd you, what you call it? Push-up? You invented? That's amazing. Now the athletes are aware. They're doing their own research. They're looking to see their, hey, I saw this guy, Connor Carrick. He does this thing. What do you think about that? So there are some good things. I, I like that athletes are educated. I like that they're taking an interest. Um... I don't always love that the you know that whatever the flavor of the week is, and they think that's the way to go. Um, but I have to I have to I have to embrace that and realize that they are they are watching the videos, they're looking at these things. I've got to stay current with it. And and like Orlando said, it's not good enough for me to say, oh, that's stupid. That's that that's not going to work anymore with athletes. You have to explain. Okay, listen, here's why we're not doing that thing you saw on Instagram. I know it looks cool, and I know the guy looks jacked who's doing the thing. Or, you know, or, or he looks really cool athletic while he's doing it. But here, here's my reason why we're not doing it. And I've chosen not to do it because I, I can only do what I believe in my heart is the right thing for you. And maybe I'm wrong, but it's, it's the truth according to me. So it's the way I see it. And we just, I, I got to go with that. So, but yeah, I, I appreciate the question because that's a constant battle for me. And, and uh, it's funny that I go round and around and around and I spent the last week or two going over our summer program and at la yesterday agonizing with, with Mikey, who Orlando knows we're in the, we're in the office racking our brains. And at the end of the day, the program is, you know, 
really kind of similar to the one we, we did before. And there's a lot of things that Orlando would see that we're, we're doing the same stuff that we were doing 23 years ago. You know, so uh, I think the Instagram, uh, Instagram is a, a real thing. It's not going anywhere. Social media is not going anywhere. But I do appreciate that you realize that there, there is some real training that's not very Instagram worthy. Right. And- I, th- I, th- I think you hit something on the head too, Matt, in terms of it being partly about entertainment. Um, I think where we run into challenges where people get things misconstrued and think that's actually something I should try. Right. Uh, because they could get hurt. Right. And, and some of the stuff is just it's nonsensical, uh, but it's funny. And I think that in the current context or in the context of the last couple of years, sometimes people don't even want to do what's best. They just want to see funny. Right. They just want like comic relief from their life, from the journey that they're on, from the pressures or whatever. So but it's where they when people um, get it confused as that could be something I could do because there's just so much out there. Uh, that's when we, you know, they could run into issues and challenges. See, the part of how I started this conversation is around the parallels between the sport or the world of sport and the world of, let's say, entrepreneurship um, or business building. And it's the same thing with respect to building a business or even marketing where Everyone has some fancy schmancy new gimmicky thing. It's like, this is going to work and you should do all these. And then it's so confusing and annoying. And typically it's the fundamentals that work the best. Like Matt mentioned, I'm doing something from 23 years ago. It's the same in business. The the same principles typically apply. There's, There's always cutting edge stuff and there's always new and interesting ways to do things. But most people skip learning the fundamentals. And they want to jump straight into... Um, I'm doing a TikTok dance where I'm pointing to things or whatever the hell the thing is at the time, right? Um, I, Matt, I'm curious. You, you mentioned you trained pro athletes and I think you used the word executives. So you have um, either executives or entrepreneurial types coming in. Have you seen any patterns or through lines or commonalities with the people who win at the highest level across both spectrum. So from the athlete side and the entrepreneurial side. Absolutely. Uh, no question. And it's, uh, I mean, they're all, you know, elite professional athletes or elite Olympic athletes. Uh, you know, they have so many commonalities with elite entrepreneurs or executives or whatever. They're all, they're all very goal oriented people. They're very competitive people. They've got this incredible internal drive. Uh, you know, all, all of my executive clients, uh, they, have, they have a passion for some type of rigorous physical pursuit. Now, whether, whether that's lift, you know, in some cases it's lifting weights. Some of them are triathletes or cyclists. Some of them like to surf, whatever. But there's some, there's some element of their life that, that definitely is devoted to that practice. You know, in the case of a professional athlete, it's their job. They have to do those things. For the executives, it's not, but it's equally important to them. I think that they're all, you know, that that uh, that goal-oriented nature, that adaptability. That that's a, you know, Connor spoke about that, like literally living every day of your life as a pro athlete, not knowing when you know some guy's going to walk down the hallway and call you in for a meeting, and you know, or not knowing when you're going to see your name on the ticker of, of the TV screen is having gotten been traded or what your one bad practice or one bad training camp away from being unemployed, you know, for the, you know, for the average, uh, you know, government employee or, or, you know, salary unionized worker, maybe those aren't a reality, but you know, Gio, as an entrepreneur, you know, I, you and I, we can, I can take every day off if I want to, I can go backpacking in Europe. I can go to Maui and go surfing for a month. I just don't make any money. That's fine. It's, it's all good. Right. This whole, this, you know, this concept of passive income, I, I think is a crock of shit. I think there's income you don't have to be physically present for, but it's not passive. You're all, you're always working for it. So I think that much like those athletes, entrepreneurs are, are you know, they, they eat what they kill. Uh, they live with that, a certain level of underlying stress that you're, you're, you know, what have you done? For, like Connor said, what have you done for me lately? You're only as good as your, your last game. You and I are only as good as our last project, our last event, our last gig, whatever it was. So. Yeah, there's certainly certainly lots and lots of parallels for sure. What does you mentioned internal drive? What does that mean? 
I, I think that, you know, I, the, the best, and it's funny, I was actually just speaking about this this morning to a completely different group, but you, you hear these stories, uh, Connor will appreciate, you know, the stories of Sidney Crosby down in the basement shooting pucks against the dryer. Or I'm, I'm, I'm super old, but I used to I hear about like, you know, Herschel Walker in his backyard tying cinder blocks because he didn't have any money and, and where he grew up and he would tie cinder blocks to his, his legs and run or hey, or for Connor, a couple of Chicago guys here, Chicago uh, or Connor in Orlando, Chris Zorich from Notre Dame, not having enough money for a gym and taking sewer grates out of the road and like pressing them and all these, all these cool stories. The part that's missing from the stories is it wasn't a guy like me standing beside Sidney Crosby saying, 29, 30, 31, you know, six more. It, it was, th this kid went downstairs and wanted to shoot those pucks against the dryer. Those guys, you know, Walter Payton going out and running, you know, running up the hills in the dikes in Mississippi. There wasn't some guy with a stopwatch and a, and a pad and a pen or and no one was Instagramming it and showing what was happening. So I think there is, that's the same as those, those entrepreneurs, guys like you, Gio, that you know what? No one's going to know other than maybe Steph if you just mail it in tomorrow, you know, you could probably just sleep in, you know, throw on Netflix, tell everybody you're in meetings. No one's going to, everyone's going to assume you've got some really exotic, you know, important meetings that you can't be with them that day. And you can just have a personal day and mail it in, but you don't because you have that internal drive to show up, even though you don't have to, you don't have a boss who's looking for you, but you, you're, you're the boss and you know, you, you're accountable to yourself. And I think that all the best athletes do, they have that own accountability to themselves to be the best version of themselves that they can be. So here's a fun question for all of you. Do you think that there's only a percentage of people who have that drive or is it based on a specific obsession and some people just haven't figured out what the obsession is? This is something I toss around because I, you know, I, you mentioned Steph, I, um, like I have a trainer who comes here twice a week to train me because I, I love it and I need it. And it's also because it's blocked on my calendar, which makes it a priority. So even if I don't feel like it, I know Igor, Igor's coming over and he's going to kick my ass. Uh, Steph doesn't need that. Every morning, she, no matter what, she's in, we have a, a giant gym in the basement. Um, she's down there pushing PRs out of nowhere. Like I don't, to me, it's one of the most marvelous thing to watch because she does it by herself. Um, now, I may not have it for training in that way, but I have it for entrepreneurship and I have it for this show and I have it for um, the events we do. Like, I'm obsessed. And to me, that's, I found it. My thing is bringing people together, even right now, this. So I found it and, I'm, and no one could ever tell me not to do this. So I'm curious, do you, like, I don't have this answer. I'm just curious if you think everyone has this, they just haven't figured out the obsession or it's a quality that not everybody has. I'll go first, G, because I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this where, like, I played other sports growing up, and I loved them. They were a good time. But it, it wasn't hockey for me. Like, hockey chose me. And like Matt was talking about, if there was any training exercise I heard about a player that I looked up to did, it was integrated that day. I remember reading about, you know, Johnny Tays would – uh, skate in the morning before school out on you know the lake and I didn't have a lake so I just rollerbladed every day like 6 a.m. before school like the next day I remember when I first started working out I belonged to the sportsplex in Orland Park and there was a sign on the wall that said you know the average adult exercises three times a week for a half hour all the way down to a bodybuilder trains six days a week for four hours and I was like well, I'll bet hockey players work harder than bodybuilders. So my workout today is I just need to stay here four hours. Like I, I had no idea what I was doing, right? I was like 12 or 13. But now I'm in an interesting spot where I have some interests. I have some other things that I, you know, study and, and play with. And similar to UG where you could, I, I am a bit on the obsessed side. I, I have to listen and learn about these things, but I'm curious. I'm like, is that my thing? Cause I'm still playing which takes a certain degree of my energy, you know, res resource, my uh, resources. And I'm like, is this the thing? Am I in the middle of finding the thing? I'm not sure yet. And so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in between both. Um, we'll see. I don't know. I'm curious what you guys have to say. I could so relate to the, is this my thing type thing. I was actually 
uh, before I came back to, uh, so I went to Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, Illinois, home of the Huskies. Come on, somebody. Uh, and, and then I started working um, in downtown Chicago uh, at a consulting company. And I, I came back um, to have an opportunity to serve. I didn't know what serve, like I didn't know what exactly that meant. I just know that I needed to do something that would give perspective to others. Right. So when I came back, um, I would have I would have meetings. And Matt Matt would know because we would train and they'd be like, Why are you all dressed up? I'd be like, I have a meeting. I'm going to meet with this person. And they're like, Why are you meeting with them? I was like, Listen, I'm just trying to see is this the thing? Is it speaking in schools? Is it training police and racial sensitivity? Is it working with sick kids? Is it working with, with folks who are marginalized in other ways, newcomers? And trying to figure out what it is. And in order to figure that out, I had to lose myself in those things. I give everything to give it a shot to know whether or not that was a thing or what about that thing it was that really resonated with me. Um, so I applaud you for, for, for that because it is like, is this it? I don't know. Is this? And, and it's a journey. It's a journey. Um, going uh, to back to Gio's question around that, you know, drive, that inner drive, that burning desire is it in everyone? I think there are things that could happen in life that could call that out of people. Um, I don't think the majority, I think it's a small percentage of people that, that walk with that sense of purpose uh, every single day. Um, and, and, but I think it's in there um, and can potentially be cultivated if they're exploring like Connor is and saying, is this it? If they're open, right? Because you could be presented with the thing, and and miss it, you know. So so I, I you know I, I think that um, we've had folks that have become ambassadors of things that they weren't connected to at all two years ago because of a life incident or an inciting incident. Something happens and they're like, oh my gosh, I now see the world differently, and and now this is my purpose, and they move like that. Right. So for, for some, I think it's like, all right, I have to be I have to show up. I have to be my absolute best. I got to bring it. And uh, and that could come from just an internal something that happens earlier on in life or it could come at a later point where uh, there's a, a life incident that shifts how they see the world and their role in the world. I think the opposite happens even more. And let me explain what I mean. Um, I, previous to running this business, Archangel, and doing all the things that you all know me for, I was in the real estate space. And in Toronto, I was selling pre-construction condo investments, and I was one of the top people in that world. And making a lot of good money, very successful, winning awards, being featured in magazines. My identity was attached to that, and secretly I hated it. Like, I, I just did not like the work I was doing. Um, I wasn't a giant fan of the industry or the, like I had some friends, but it was just very, it was all about just making money and that's not aligned with my values, but I didn't understand it then. So I was depressed. I was very anxious. And then how do you tell people, uh, I don't like this when they see you in a spotlight and I'm bringing that up because I have a feeling there are a lot of pro athletes who aren't, it's not their thing but it's their, I don't know, their dad's thing or whoever pushed them into that direction and they want to make their parents happy or there's, there's some kind of reason like that. And I think that this happens to a lot of people, especially if you get successful at the thing and then you you're probably feel like you're trapped and you, you're trapped with the identity of it too and then you don't want to let people down. Um, and have you guys seen, I'm assuming you have, but have you guys seen this kind of thing too? I'll, I'll share one story. It's, I'll, the players shall remain nameless, but it was a guy that I had a real good relationship with, and uh, we tr he, we traded him away. Or he just he didn't re-sign with us, and he was at the end of his career, a very famous player. And when the team came back to play our team, one of the uh, the stick boys, the assistant, came into our room and said, "Hey, so and so is on the ice, you know, with the visiting team. They they want to talk to you." So I went out to see this guy. I was I was really excited because he was a guy I really you know had developed a good relationship with. I was happy to see him, gave him a hug. I said, I said how, how are you feeling? He said, terrible. I said, what? He goes, oh my God. He goes, I'm like an old dog with bad hips. He goes, I can't. He goes, I, he goes, have you seen me play? He goes, I'm terrible. I can't play anymore. And I said, what? He goes, he goes, yeah, but his team was out there. He said, yeah, but 
these idiots, like in, the coach was maybe maybe 10 feet away. The coach, GM, everybody, the whole team, he said, but these idiots want to pay me $3.5 million. So what what the hell am I supposed to do? <laughs> He's like, I, 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 like, so basically this is a guy who really, really didn't, you know, he was done, you know, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, He's done, but the the rational part of his brain said, I'm so good that even at 50% of my capabilities and 5% of my emotional drive, I'm still able to generate $3.5 million doing this. So I don't know, I'll do it, I guess. But like, you know, like, and and it's, you know, it's, so I do, I do see that. And uh, it's a common thing. And I think that, uh, you know, Orlando touched on something. I think it can work both ways. Orlando said, maybe, Maybe something hasn't happened yet in their life to spark that passion. I think that's true. I think sadly, I've seen some other people that things have happened in their life that, you know, doused the flame, diminished the passion. Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe they didn't have the same, you know, fortitude that Orlando had or, or the support network that he had. But I've seen people have unfortunate things completely outside of their control and, you know, and, and maybe they couldn't do that. And in Gio, to your story, I think you, you and I probably both know people that maybe would have wished for something different, but they stepped up for a family and said, hey, you know what? I got to pay the mortgage. I got kids in school. I can't go chase my dream of being a, you know, I don't know, being a rock star or, or traveling the world or writing that great book. I, I just got to step up and get the job done. I think, I, think there's, I, I think there's something noble about that too. I know, uh, you know, my upbringing, my, my dad probably would have been a, a really good athlete, but he grew up, he grew up very poor and that wasn't an option for him. You know, he wasn't allowed to play sports. He had to go work. And he's a guy that probably could have been a good something if he had the opportunity, but he had to step up and, and make some money and, and then, you know, get on with his life. So I think there's, I, I want to be careful when I say that. Cause I, I don't, I think that everybody can find it. Like you did Gio, you, you found your path and, and I see how passionate you are and how successful you are. And even that word that you used, successful i mean you were very successful making money in real estate but i'm sure now when you look back you're much more successful now you're you know like the the definition of success changes but i think just i I don't i don't think you know just just on our our little call here i i'm not i can't hold a candle to the drive and the passion that orlando has and i think and i'm proud of myself and what i do but he's a special person and i don't you know I, i I don't think everybody's going to be Orlando and I don't think everybody's going to play hockey like Sidney Crosby or play basketball like Michael Jordan. I don't think that's a realistic expectation, regardless of what we tell our kids in school these days. I don't think that's real. Uh, But I think you can be you can be passionate about, you know, things that maybe don't get the same critical acclaim. You can be passionate about being a great dad or a great mom. You can be passionate about doing a good job at the at at the grocery store, the bank or wherever you work. I don't think it has to always be. Right. making billions of dollars or, you know, making the Hall of Fame winning trophies. I don't think money and happiness are are aligned. And I think that's the misconception, misconception people have. Like, Matt, I bet you've had people you've trained that are maybe even multi-multi-millionaire, maybe even billionaire, and they're depressed like crazy. I, would, I, because... I mean, I, I would say there's almost an inverse correlation. At least in my executive clientele, there's almost an inverse correlation. And the wealthiest wow. client, and I, I do have clients that are worth north of a billion dollars. The you know one of the wealthiest people that I've ever met in my life was also one of the most unhealthy, unhappy, stressed out. You know, like and I, and I thought that you know here's a guy like I, I've got more free time than this person. That's crazy. How does that work? That doesn't make any sense at all. Right. You know, like this is, a, you know, when you get to that level of wealth where literally you could, you could stop now and never earn another dollar and you've got enough for 10 lifetimes, but you don't. And I don't, I, you know, it's, I don't, I don't, that, that, that is an example of that, that internal drive yeah. for a definition of success that, that, you know, you have, you know, subscribed to that probably is not the right one or it's not a healthy one anyway, but. Right. Connor, you mentioned, yeah. um, what have you done for me 10 minutes ago? <laughs> so when you're in that place, how do you reset? Right? So if, if let's say, and I'm thinking from the paradigm of your, anyone listening or watching is in their day to day, let's say someone is uh, entrepreneurial and then there's a, a crisis that happens or a fire that has to get put out or something that just knocks you down in, in some um, intangible way. And you have to psychologically get back up. What is that methodology? 
You know, one of the more grounding uh, practices and questions that I asked of myself earlier in my career, because I used to be that athlete, you know, kind of struggled with an anxiety disorder since I was a young kid. So we've, we're, we've talked a little bit about what is a person's sort of hardware? What are, what are they born like? You know, do they have the fire belly or not? Um, you know, what's their relationship to neuroticism? Do negative uh, events really affect them or do they, you know, are they shower in Teflon and it just doesn't seem to bother them, right? Like Matt Orlando, I know you've played with these players and coached them. I play with guys like they'll make a game ruining mistake, totally blew it. And they will come back to the bench with no concept that it was their fault. They walk away from it. Like it was a fire that what, they didn't throw the match for. And uh, I was never that guy. And I, and I would actually gawk at them with, with jealousy, with envy. Like how, how do I get built like that? <laughs> and I don't know if it's necessarily possible to go in and, and totally rewire, you know, the, the, the hardware, but like a question that I asked myself earlier in my career was, okay, Connor, if, if you care so much about success and doing well, as you say you do, and you think you're a sharp kid, which you, you think you are, you will be creative enough to figure out how to chill the fuck out and get over this and understand that there is a shadow to this drive. It will hurt when you don't do well, but they are two sides of the same energy. And I would not choose to live my life without that energy. So now it's dealing with the price, dealing with the, uh, I'm a big Alan Watts guy and every inside has an outside and, and vice versa. And when I started to see those troubles um, as the same side of the coin as my successes and then that they were born out of the same seed, I, I started to, I think, see some of the frameworks and understand that this isn't going anywhere and actually I, I, would, I would choose to feel this way again uh, if managed properly and it doesn't you know, leach into all my personal relationships in my marriage, which it has before. My wife, you know, looked at me and said, you know, at some point you're going to have to stop being miserable around here. Um, you know, so both some internal questions, some outside uh, perspective or reminding that like, hey, wake up, you're, you're bigger than this uh, has been really helpful for me. I love that, man. I, I appreciate that, Connor. And even the thought of it, uh, you know, that drive and, and you know, success and, and, and learning being opposite sides of the same coin um, and the things that people are celebrated for in terms of that drive, that no matter what, that hustle that, you know, c can um, can be of great benefit, but also of great detriment. And um, I'm grateful that you have uh, human barometers, <laughs> folks that will keep you accountable and say, hey, you... Um, I know you're that guy that's on TV, but you need to check yourself real quick, <laughs> right? Because you're your dad here or your hubby here, right? So and we need we need that energy here. So um, I'm grateful that, that you've had that. Some people don't have that. For some people, there's no... And people might see them and they're afraid to keep it real with them because they've established themselves as this Teflon, you know, as this person that's unflappable no matter what. So, you know, and they'll carry that, you know, so I'm, I'm so, I'm appreciative in, in just learning more about your journey um, and understanding that of your perspective around that um, and recognizing that you have people that can hold you accountable or that can be a mirror for you to help you see things that, that you may not have seen. I, that's what I, I love about our circles, the folks that we ro roll with, um, you know, we have folks that would be like, um, yeah, you know what? You need to you need to calm down a little bit. Um, you need to not take it so hard. But then also be understanding. If Because there's so much prep, as you know, that goes into a game. Then you, you lose a game. And let's say you had a play. You're playing the, the play over. Well, th maybe this is just me. I'm playing the play over in my head. I could have done that differently, man. I could have well, done that Right? <laughs> and, and I think as an athlete, like, there are real consequences and and to make it to the highest level you have to have a degree of um an, an ability to sort through that and, and yeah. continue to perform because otherwise you get weeded out the guys yeah. that you know burn out stress out they don't make it to this yeah. level yeah 
Uh, but I, I remember I was on a penalty kill this year, which is where you know the other team has more players than you. And we were on a five on three. They have five players. We have three, which is basically like a block shot fest. They're going to hammer pucks into the three defenders, and it's, it's really a tough spot to be in in hockey. And I broke my leg a couple of years ago on a puck impact and missed four months of the season, and it cost me a lot. And I remember thinking to myself, like, it only happens a few times a year, but ooh, you, you shudder. And I go, you know what? I'm going to be aggressive on this five on three because I'm not letting these guys just pound pucks and, and they're going to break my leg. Like, I'm going to go down being aggressive. And if I got to get in the lane, I will. Um, but it kind of shuddered me. Like, I remembered the possibility of getting hurt, which normally isn't there. My defense partner broke his hand on that shift and had surgery and missed two months. And it, it like, was eerie to me that I felt something. Mm. I hear you, man. <laughs> I want to go back to G Gio's question. Thank you for that. And... and Every time I see folks on a on a PK and and they're sliding on the ice while guys are like winding up and shooting the puck at like a hundred miles an hour, I'm just like, man, <laughs> that's gonna hurt tomorrow and the day after that. Um, but you, you know, I think about um, there was a, a dad that would see me train and he's like, oh, you're so inspiring. I want you to train my son. So I said, okay. Um, I'm open to it, but I need to talk to your son first, right? And he's like, oh, my son's amazing. He's phenomenal at soccer. He's one of the best I've ever seen. He could do so many things. I was like, cool, this is amazing. I want to meet this young man. So I meet him. I said, hey, man, what's going on? He says, I'm good. I said, so your dad wants me to train you. He says, yeah, I heard. I'm, I'm excited. So I said, so, so what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to get a better jump shot. <laughs> I was like, um... <laughs> so like the conversation I've been having with your dad right like it's uh, he said like S what's your sport bro he says I've played soccer my whole life basketball is my passion I said alright there's some disconnect here cause your dad wants me to train you for soccer so anyhow we worked out a training regimen that would have him doing things that would transfer right lateral movement acceleration etc and we built in some soccer like headers during recovery and things like that he ends up, um, you know, through his hard work and their connections, he ends up getting a soccer scholarship. Goes down on the soccer scholarship. But before going, um, there was an issue because there was a coaching change. So the new coaches said, you're going to have to uh, pay for this year because we've allocated our scholarships for this year. So you'll have to pay for this year and then we'll bring you on next year, right, on scholarship. So is that comes up with $30,000, pays for year one tuition. He goes away to school. And three weeks later, he comes home. And he says, his dad's like, you know, what are you doing here? He's like, I'm done. This was never my dream. It was yours. Right? And I always remember that. Because this was when, like, I think, like, before we even had kids. Right? And I was just like, man, like... You can't put your dream on anybody else, right? Like you can't, it, it has that drive, needs to come from them and then you cultivate and you support. But you try to put that in to, to them, there, there are consequences that, that might not be uh, positive. Matt, so um, we had a speaker at our 2016 event. His name is Philip McKernan, who has also been a, a mentor and coach for me. I've, I've worked with him a lot um, and also interviewed him on this show. And one of the things that he said to me at that our very first big summit event was stay humble. Just never lose yourself because as things grow and all this, just never lose yourself because he's seen that pattern over and over again. And he also trains... Um, ironically, soccer players, pro pro soccer players, um, and I'm wondering, Matt, do you ever have to be a therapist? Is is the work that you're doing typically only strength, or like, do you have the players coming in when they're in some kind of slump or or challenge, and they need a different kind of support? And what have you seen them in terms of how they can turn around? I mean, that's that's actually my favorite part of what I do for sure. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I've, I've been lifting weights in a weight room since I was 14 years old. It was a huge part of my life. It was probably all I cared about until I was, you know, 21 or 22 or 23 years old. And I'm, I'm still, 
I'm still pretty good in the in the weight room. I can get it done. I can coach it up a little bit. I still I still love it. Uh, I, I especially love. I mean, really special stuff for me having like Orlando and his son in my gym, working out. You know, makes me feel proud and old all at the same time. But I, I so I still love. It. I don't want. I I don't want to discount that. But I, I have fantastic coaches uh, on the team that work with me now. That they're you know Mike Mikey Carnero has been with me now 13 years. I mean, I, I, I used to say he's as good as I am. He's probably better because he's, he's more like he's, he's staying in tune with all the latest and greatest. But I, I, the real magic for me are those moments in between the sets, the moment after the workout, you know, when a guy will slide into the office and we have a real heart to heart, um, you know, when athletes are injured and they feel like they've lost their identity, like we were talking about before. When athletes are at the end of the road and, you know, it's their last year and the calls are not coming in and it's, you know, it's, Labor Day weekend and they don't have a contract yet. Those are the moments that are, are really special to me because I think that, you know, I think I, I, I'm proud of what I do in the gym. I think I'm a good coach, but there's lots of good coaches out there. Lots of good speed coaches and strength coaches and guys that know more about little aspects of the job than I do. But uh, I, I really enjoy that part. And I feel because that's where you really, really can make a difference. You know, if I, if I put 20 pounds on somebody's squat or, you know, may take a – Tenth of a second off their time—that's great. But you know, if you can if you can change someone's perspective on that and help them, you know, find their identity or refine, you know, relocate their identity or take a guy who's you know kind of walking down a bad road and get him back on the right one—that that's that's a blessing to be able to do that. Matt is uh, Matt's humble too. You talk about that humility. Matt Matt is one that. Um, if he has an athlete that is, let's say they're used to coming in and they're used to lifting like 100 pounds, right? And they're doing 100 pounds on, you know, dumbbell, and then they come in one day and they're like, they're like struggling at 90. Matt will ask, what'd you do yesterday? What happened this past weekend? How's your family doing? So he's intuitive in terms of understanding that there are external influences on our performance as athletes, as people, right? And he, he will adopt or change, adapt, I should say, their workout uh, and the stress load on the workout if there are other stressors that are impacting their performance because they can actually injure themselves if they're not focused and locked in and doing complex movements or just moving a lot of weight. And, and those things are factors. It's not just like... All right, so on the sheet it says you're about to do 110 the next set. So guess what you're doing? 110 the next set. It's, it's, he's not that guy. And, but there are coaches like that. Connor is probably because he's, he's probably had a, had a couple, right? Uh, but but it, it's being intuitive. It's asking the question. It's building relationship. And then it's making sure that you're getting the best out of that athlete on that day, right? So that they can be their absolute best. And learn that they also need to mitigate against things that make that can impact their performance and recognize when there are external things impacting their performance so that they could they could deal i love matt so much for being humble um even over the past years any events you've attended of mine or whatever it is you'd be like just introduce me as like a i don't know a coach or a strength coach <laughs> and you don't have to worry about all this other stuff that might have happened i i if you don't mind um i would because I don't actually know the story. I just want to know how BioSteel started. Like, what actually happened when you were with the teams, and how did that evolve? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's funny. And Orlando can speak to this. I mean, ever since I knew him 23 years ago, this is a was an area of passion for me. I was always interested in nutrition and supplementation, this sort of thing. And... Uh, you know, one of my mentors that Orlando got to know as well, Dr. Moro Di Pasquale, was a, was a huge influence on me. And uh, it was when I when I started working for the Toronto Maple Leafs that I I think it, unless like Connor and Orlando obviously can speak to it uh, better than I can because they they lived it. They were the man in the arena. You know, like as the as the fabled quote goes. But uh, until I worked in pro sports, I mean, I had worked around it. I was an off-season guy. I was a private guy. I, I knew f physiologically, biomechanically what athletes needed to do. But it wasn't until I was there all day, every day, on the plane, in the hotel, in the arena, and when you realize the lifestyle, especially especially in, in hockey, where these guys now are playing every other day, 
you know, they have a game, you know, at, at 9.30 at 10 o'clock at night when the game's over and everyone at home clicks the remote and goes up to bed. These guys were in the gym lifting weights, training, taking a shower. Then we're on a, you know, on a bus, getting on a plane, flying to a different country, getting off into the hotel, practice the next morning, nap, game. It's this lifestyle is, it's crazy. The, the rigors of the life, forget it, forget about the body checks and the slap shots and breaking your leg, just the rigors of the lifestyle of flying and all the lack of sleep and stress. And, you know, every day is a, you know, you might lose your job. I, I didn't understand the stress and the importance of recovery until I worked in the league. So it, it was in that first year when I realized these, these guys, this is a crazy, crazy lifestyle. And it's really, really hard to recover. And it's really hard to stay healthy. And, and, and it's better now. But, Connor, you have to take my word for it. Like, at the time, I, I was very regimented in my lifestyle, with my training, um, with my nutrition. Maybe what Orlando doesn't know is that any workout that those, those NFL and CFL guys did, when they left, I, I, was, I knew what Orlando did that day. I'm going to try to lift more than he did. And I'm going to try to run faster than this guy. Because I, I, in my mind at that time... I still hadn't resigned myself to the fact that I'm washed up. I still felt like, hey, man, someone's going to call. I'm going to be like Marky Mark in that movie. I'm going to the, you know, the, the <laughs> Eagles are going to call me and I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be a walk on. But but what I realized is that, you know, at seven o'clock at night, when your body should be winding down and getting ready for sleep, these guys are getting jacked up to play a game. And, you know, at that time, there was no drug testing in sports. So guys were taking everything under the sun. Uh, to get wired for this game at seven o'clock at night. And then they'd be dehydrated and they're replenishing their electrolytes with all these drinks that were packed with sugar and artificial colors and artificial flavors and blah, blah, blah. And I just thought this is this, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And we were trying to do it with supplements. Uh, but at the time there was no regulation in that industry either. So they sort of had this, you know, uh, all this, uh, all these events that sort of culminated where you've got, these guys that need some better, healthier form of, of, of energy for games, some better, healthier form of recovery on a day-to-day -day basis. Supplementation is an option, but there's no regulation in that industry. And now at that time in 2003, which is when I created these products, they were just about to announce that there was going to be drug testing in the NHL. So literally we, we had, Connor, you, you know, the Clydesdale skate trunk, like every team, mm -hmm. every, every team in hockey has the same trunks it's like a like a rock band when they go on the road they get the same trunks that they load up and ours ours were these filled we had one like it was filled with every kind of pill powder lotion potion anything you could think of with swedish labels and finnish labels and russian labels and czech labels and and none of it, none of it was tested none of it was regular so i thought okay this is just there's got to be something and there was nothing out there so i thought you know instead of I mean, Gio and I went to Catholic school. There's a lot of things they told you, just don't do that. And, you know, that, 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 that doesn't always work so well. So I, I knew that just telling guys, don't use supplements. That's it. Okay, Start, starting now, don't use any supplements. We're done. That's not going to work. And I knew that telling them, hey, uh, these sports drinks are unhealthy, so just don't drink any of them. That, that's not going to work. I had to provide, instead of complaining, I wanted to provide a solution. So that was sort of the genesis of, of me creating those products. That's so you did it for the team first, and then it just kind of people started hearing about it. And it took yeah, off. I think I apologize. I got some background background noise there. My my attack dog is ready to get the Amazon guy. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was it. I mean, there was no you know there was no plan to take over the world. It was it wasn't about that. It was about I've got 23 guys that are under my care that I'm responsible for their health. Uh, they look to me for advice on this topic. I'm, I'm, I'm giving, uh, you know, I'm distributing products that I, I don't believe in. I don't think they're good. I don't think they're beneficial to these athletes. There isn't, a, there isn't an alternative that exists, but I think there must be, you know, I, I'm a, a scientifically minded person. I, I thought there's got to be some way to do this better. And that, that was sort of the genesis. And then, you know, the players like it. And I didn't know, to be honest with you, and, and hockey guys are, hockey guys are good guys. They're all good guys. And I think if you're, if you're a trainer, if you know, like, if you're a good guy, and Connor can can attest to this, I didn't know if they were using the products because I'm a good guy and I made them, and they didn't want to hurt my feelings, and like they kind of suck. But he's a good enough guy, and he made he poured his heart and soul into this thing, so we'll try it. Or I, or because they're lazy and they're cheap, and it's sitting right in front of them, and they're not they couldn't be bothered to go 
find something else. I never knew that, but then all of a sudden, you know, players would get traded away or they would sign with a new team. And then I would get a call or an email. Hey, can you send me some of that stuff that we had? <laughs> you know, and then I get a call from the strength coach on their team. Hey, we got so-and-so on our team now. He's talking about some thing you guys have. What is it? Where do I buy it? Where do I get this? And we had a couple a couple of friends and colleagues of mine in the NFL or in the NBA that, that you know, started using it. The Rat Toronto Raptors, you know, their strength coach was a friend of mine. They had a, they had a player on their team, high-profile guy that was struggling with, with uh, you know, his hydration, struggling with recovery between games. And it just sort of organically, you know, one person tells a friend and they tell a friend and grew from there. That is the coolest story ever. I love that. Thank you. It's, yeah, it's, it's different. It's unique. <laughs> uh, Orlando, what is One Voice, One Team? Uh, one Voice, One Team is a youth leadership charity that helps young people see beyond their current circumstances and tap into their gifts, some of which they don't realize are gifts. Uh, we'll tap into those gifts so that they, they can make a difference in someone else's life. And in doing so, they actually make a difference in their own lives as they grow and as they evolve. So um, prior to the, the call, Connor and I were chatting briefly about uh, our recent visit to Chicago. We were there last week um, uh, doing some work with some young people on the south side of the city, on the west side of the city, and at uh, Northern Illinois University with some of the athletes there. And... You know, it was just re a real powerful experience being able to pour out. And I, we brought a team, a group of young people that have that have been in our program since the 11th grade that are now working full time here uh, that we were able to bring that uh, were able to see themselves and their ability to contribute to other people's perspective in a whole different light. So we run summer camps. We run um uh, programming like assemblies and workshops in schools. We train educators uh, from a PD perspective around how to create safe and brave spaces and how to um, and on allyship and anti-oppression. And we empower and equip young people to just to be difference makers and game changers. And uh, sometimes we say, despite the challenges, we say in light of the challenges that they face, so that they could step into what's possible. Well, you, you had me come in and, and speak to one of the groups, which was one of my favorite things ever. And I love doing that. Um, what, how did that unfold for you? Like what, what made you get to the place where you're like, Oh, I need to do this. Yeah. Well, I think part of it was the, you know, going through that whole assault and, and, you know, and it came at a time like Connor was talking about trying different things and saying, is it this thing? Is it this? Is it this? Well, one of the things I was doing was working with, um, uh, marginalized youth, so newcomer, uh, immigrant, refugee, or underserved youth. And on Friday nights, we'd have them all in a gym and running activities. It was amazing. And um, when I was assaulted, and uh, the morning after the assault, I go to the hospital, uh, and uh, the nurse looks at me, and and she's got, she so she's got like a. Sorry, I like to I act things out sometimes. So she's got these glasses on, right? Like, so she's she has her clipboard in front of her, and she says, "So, um, what happened to you?" So I look at my wife, and I'm like, this, "She's not gonna believe this, right?" So I'm like, "I got jumped," and the nurse says, "By who? The police?" <laughs> And she's just like, by who? The police? So I'm like, wait a minute. Well, why would she say that? Did she hear? So I'm like, I asked her, like, why would she say that? And she says, oh, I see it all the time. But it usually happens to teenagers or people who don't speak English well or newcomers. And I started to see the young people that were in our programs. And I thought, well, what if this was uh, Roberto's dad? What if this was uh, Kwame that this was happening? What if this was Betsy that this was happening to? And they couldn't speak the English language or they didn't have the resources what chance would they have? And I was like, this is actually bigger than us. Like, because they might find themselves, if they were in the exact same situation I'm in right now, they might find themselves losing hope and, uh, and being ready and willing to give up, right? So we have to get through this. This is not just for us. This is about giving hope to those who might lose hope in that situation. So while I was on trial... <laughs> We started serving um, at just trying to make a difference. And I remember people coming to me and saying, 
no one will ever support you. Like, your name is mud, man. Like, you should just keep a low profile. Don't your parents live in Florida somewhere? Why don't you just leave? Why don't you just go? And, and I couldn't at that time because I was, you know, facing prison time and I wouldn't be able to. Anyhow, um, it, that's what, that was the genesis for us. Uh, because we saw young people giving up when they were faced with challenges. And they'd say, you know, I, I can't get through. So for us, I was like, because of the work that we were doing, I was like, I have to get through this thing. Because if I don't, that in and of itself will send a message to all the young people that we work with that where they were like, yo, if this could happen to him, I, I might as well just I might as well just go do whatever right now. Because there's no hope. Right? So that we held on to that as a as a, a driving force for us having to get through in a way that we could serve. And and we kept looking. There has to be something positive that comes out of this. Otherwise, it wouldn't happen. I don't, you don't go from being the spokesperson of the service to being assaulted by folks in the service and and just for no reason. I believe in a bigger purpose. So it was just like, just like Connor's doing. Is this the bigger purpose? Is this the bigger purpose? Is this the bigger purpose? And until we we've found something, a vehicle that we could pour into young people and into communities that gives them hope when others tell them they probably shouldn't have. I love that. Yeah. I feel like part of, again, part of connecting you and Connor is that I'm secretly hoping to spark some fun ideas for Connor because I, I, and, and for everyone watching, because sometimes when you, when you may not have clarity about the next thing or the future, uh, one of the clues or Easter eggs could be who do you want to help instead of what do you want to do? And I think that's what started for you. And then those things unfold. It's almost like reverse engineering the what from maybe the who. Um, so I love that. And Connor, I have a question I want to ask you. I've never asked you this. And I, I can open it up for all three of you. But um, when someone is at the top of their thing, so let's say for a pro athlete, if you're in the NBA or the NHL or like there really is nothing above where you're at. Who do you take advice from and how do you know how to figure out who to take advice from? Because it must be insane. Like, um, you, you probably have people coming at you from all different directions. How do you filter that? Uh, if, if it's outside of my area of expertise, which is, you know, mostly hockey, I kind of deflect if it's, finance thing I try to use someone that knows what they're talking about there uh, and, and just focus on hockey so like my whole big thing was you know how do I support my talent how do I grow it and I think that you know there are some high-end coaches that present themselves people like the Matt Nickel Matt Nickel and, and having someone on your staff in your you know pit crew that was revolutionary uh, to, to have a, a trainer in the summers uh, and, and be working out that way, you know, I don't know, Matt, like when did it really start to become commonplace? Well, I'd say at least, I mean, maybe in the U.S. a lot, a lot, you know, a, lot, a longer time ago, but in Canada, you know, I started doing this almost 25 years ago and there was really not very many people doing it. Yeah, like you talked to kind of the generation before me, this was where they found their edge. And, you know, now it's more on like the skill side. We've seen in hockey, there's big names like, you know, Adam Oates and Gerald Belfry. They're like these, you know, hockey skill people who look at the game and dissect the game in ways that no one ever has. And it, it's incredible to see their work, you know, to use a Toronto name, like guy I played with Austin Matthews just scored 60 goals and he lights it up at five on five. Like, you know, no one has Alex Ovechkin, another guy I had the fortunate, uh, you know, ability to play with. He scored in a, in a very niche way. He scores in a lot of ways, but like the vast majority of his goals are off this big one-timer. And then all of a sudden you've got 34 in Toronto scoring in all these dynamic ways. And like there are people out there that are imagining and constructing the next score that's going to score in ways that we can't even fathom. Maybe it's a, you know, Zegras out in Anaheim, you know, flipping pucks on his stick, roller hockey style and, and tuck them in the net. And, you know, I think that, it also lends itself well to why I've had an interest in the entrepreneurial world. Like when you listen to the best of the best talk in business, at the top of their game, they are reinventing. They know what their core business is. 
but they're still projecting out like what could this look like in five ten years and I've, I've been good at that on the hockey side and if it's something I don't know enough about I uh, deflect it and someone else can help me with the decision love that I uh, I will end with a fun question um, I don't m- watch much TV I don't really watch much sports sorry guys um, <laughs> just, I have other things happening one of the shows I do watch that I love is Ted Lasso. Have any of you guys seen it? Oh yeah, it's the best. Like Orlando, oh my! <laughs> it is the best show. Like it's one of my favorite shows ever, and I highly suggest everybody watch it if you don't already. And one of the, my favorite lines from the show: there's a a therapist who works for the team. And she says, I'll be your mentor, but I'll also be your tour mentor. And uh, I feel like we we are all in this position to be leaders and, and mentors and guides for other people. And sometimes yeah. it means a little tormenting. And yet uh, on the other end of this journey comes some beauty. So th- I, I just want to thank the three of you for one of my favorite conversations. This has been so much fun. Uh, I love all three of you individually, but to have you all together has been such a blast. So thank you so much for hanging out today. Thank you, Gio. Thank you, Gio. Thanks for having us, Matt, Orlando, thank you guys. Appreciate you as well, Connor. Matt, you already know what it is, man. (laughs) Much love. Raps in seven. (laughs) Amazing. Now you're performing at your optimal levels. It's time to focus on the return of your investments. What you don't realize is you have been looking at the wrong measure of success. I'm here to tell you that you, my hero friend, are missing a vital element to succeed. See you next time as our next set of guides will show you the one element of ROI your business has forgotten.